then you're going to offer some ground rules for us. Okay. Well, I know we're going to hear a lot of um, stories today, but I was his favorite mentee. <laughs> <laughs> if you so, do say so yourself. <laughs> yeah. At least I used to tell him that, and he would say, okay, yes, Mercy, you're my favorite mentee. Um, I met Brian, see, 12 years ago when I was a student at Northwestern University getting my master's, and he was there for a bit as a visiting professor. And I remember when the email blast came out, and it said, Brian Monroe named visiting professor. And before I even opened it, I said, I know that's not the Brian Monroe who did one of the last interviews with Michael Jackson, because I'm a big Michael Jackson fan. And yes, it was that Brian Monroe. So anyway, I set up a meeting. Um, we talked. He let me listen to audio of that interview. And it's just a relationship that grew The reason why this is so emotional for me is because I lost my father five years ago, and uh, Brian was my second father um, in, light of, in light of that. So it wasn't just a professional thing. It was, he was really a good friend, and um, I'm sure some of you got these Christmas cards every year. And I've been um, looking at this uh, furniture. Um, he's helped me through all the moves in my career. Um, so I have that in the house. I just recently moved to D.C. because of Brian. Uh, I got an anchor job here, and um, my first day, he paid for me to get my makeup done. Um, he's, he was just always there, and um, I think he knew that I didn't have that father figure, and so that's why he, he was there. So when I reached out to Dorothy, I needed this, and I think a lot of us need this. It was out of a meeting, um, we talked. He let me listen to audio of that interview. He knew that I didn't have that father figure, and so that's why he, he was there. So when I reached out to Dorothy, hey, I needed this. And I think a lot of us uh, need Roland? this. It was out of a meeting, um, okay. we talked. Roland, I he think, let me listen I think to we're audio some, of that some interview. Feedback here. He knew that I didn't have uh, that Kevin, father figure, need, so need that's you guys why he, step he was up. there. So when I reached out to Dorothy, hey, I needed this. And I think a lot of us need this. It was out of a
it's all Brian C. You know, was that automatic thing of wanting to reach out to Brian to get his advice. And, you know, that that's kind of when it hit me that I wasn't going to be able to call Brian, you know, any more advice because, um, you know, he was one of, he welcomed me to the President's Club and um, embraced me. Uh, he was uh, my, my support. He was my advisor. Uh, he, he, he was the keeper of my secrets. So, you know, I, Brian and I probably spoke a, a couple of times a month, uh, if not two or three times. And then if, if something was going on, he was the person uh, who, who among those who got the phone call. And um, a few months ago, uh, we were talking about an issue and I disagreed with Brian and I was like, no, you know, I think I should do it this way, that way. And I said, because, you know, I, I can do this. And Brian said to me, you know, you do have the right to do that. You do have the authority to do that, but is it the right thing to do? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was one of those moments that you had to kind of say again, damn you right. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> it was, you know, because there were a bunch of times it was like, okay, you're right. Um, but, you know, I, 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 I take that with me and, and, um, and keep that advice in, in, in the back of my head. Um, that was one of the things I, I was all, I will always remember from Brian that is it the right thing to do? I ask myself that question a lot, and I, I thank him for that. Thank you. Uh, we'll come back to you periodically. What I'm looking at who's here, and I will try to reach out to you and kind of let you know I'm about to come to you soon. Uh, and you don't have to speak, and you could just message me back saying I prefer just to listen, and I'll respect that as well. I see... I see three former presidents of NABJ here, so I'll start with them. Arthur Pinnell, would you like to share? Hello, NABJ, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Um, thank you, um, Mr. President, Madam President. Um, my intention uh, today was was just to sit quietly and listen and and reflect as we've all been doing because this was surely a shocker. Uh, I had to look at the the message a couple of times because I said this can't be right. Um, but um, and then to see the outpouring um, that that made me feel good and it continues to come in and the people on this call. Uh, you know, um, we as former presidents of NABJ, we share a, a, a unique fraternity, sorority club. And uh, there is a closeness there that I think that unless you, you're, you're in it, you might not understand. Um, and my times with Brian were always very good. Um, you know, the, always Mr. President, Mr. President, and as everyone has been saying in the expressions I've been reading, he was just a go-to, know how to get things kind of done guy. And so uh, I appreciated that about him. And um, uh, President Lowe, I really enjoyed your article uh, that you shared. Uh, there was a lot of priceless information in there. Really well done. Thank you, sir, for sharing that with all of us. Uh, we're going to miss Brian. Uh, we salute his achievements and we marvel at what he was able to do. And, um, you know, it's a torch that we've all got to hold up. It reminds us that life is fragile. Um, live it to the fullest every day. And so uh, I thank you, NABJ. I won't take up any more of your time. As I said, my intention was just to listen um, and not to be overbearing. So thank you. Thank you very much. I know. Uh... Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Will Sutton, uh, former president, would you please share? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, 
Uh, this this uh, this has been particularly hard for me uh, this week. Um, I uh, am uh, pleased that um, everybody's responded the way that they have. I know uh, Brian felt uh, the love while he was uh, with us. Uh, I believe he's uh, feeling the love now as he's uh, watching. Um, had the pleasure of getting to know Brian uh, before his uh, NABJ entry and um, uh, encouraged him to uh, bring some of what he had into NABJ. Um, I always have encouraged folks to uh, be themselves and bring what they have to the table and bring the best of that to NABJ. Brian had so much to offer and had proven that and was still proving that before entering NABJ that I really wanted to see him come in and give some of that to NABJ. And I was very pleased when he agreed to step in and step up. Um, he did so much for us and uh, we're still feeling the, uh, the impact. Um, and um, I, I, I'm, I'm not able to be uh, more eloquent about this at this time uh, because it's uh, been uh, really hard as somebody who was there with Brian before he came into NABJ in a big way. Uh, but I'm very pleased that he did, grateful for what he's done, grateful that uh, he's had the impact. And um, my prayers are, are with him and his family. And I'm glad to hear uh, Dean Boardman that uh, there'll be some movement in that direction. And uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Dean Seppos uh, was uh, critical with uh, Brian's uh, professional development, which allowed him to contribute to NABJ in the way uh, that he did. Um, uh, if I haven't responded to you in recent days, just uh, I've tried to send people a note or a text or something, but just understand that uh, I'm at a, a, a raw place right now. Uh, but I um, am so grateful that uh, people have benefited from what he has contributed and what he's done on our landscape. Thank you, sir. Uh, President Greg Lee, please. Greg, 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 he was just here. I was just looking at, oh, they, are you there? All right, hold on. Um, we don't have you muted, so you have yourself muted. We can't hear you. Uh, is that you now? All right. We're going to come, we're, let's figure it out, we'll come to you. Uh, Jerry Sepos, I'm sorry, David. Jerry Sep, no, David, David Boardman, you are perhaps of all the people on this call, maybe, and I'll, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sorry, but you tell them, tell us how long you've known, you knew Brian and, and over the years yeah. and what you were doing with him in recent days. Um, uh, uh, thank you all. Thanks for I'm doing this and, and, and for, for welcoming me. Um, Brian, I've known Brian probably as long or maybe longer than anybody else on, on the call. Um, we met in, I think it was 1985 when he was a, a student at the University of Washington and editor of the school paper there. And I was a cub reporter and, and he was a summer photography intern for us. And we became friends, um, had 
had a close and, and wonderful friendship for 35 years. Um, during that time, uh, through his career, and uh, you know, just watching him thrive, uh, particularly at the Mercury News and with Knight Ritter and working with Jerry, um, he was essential as, as I became an editor and ultimately the editor-in-chief of the Seattle Times. He helped me in our efforts uh, to, to really bring more diversity to the paper. He was, he was crucial in that. Um, seven years ago, I moved uh, to Temple University uh, to become the dean there. And one of the very first things that I aimed to do was, was uh, to bring Brian Monroe aboard. Um, those of you who are, uh, have, have worked in the academy know that's, that's not a simple thing for a dean. Um, you, can, you can lure somebody to apply, but then um, you know, the, the faculty has to buy in. And, um, and as I expected, Brian just wowed our faculty and he was the first choice of many wonderful candidates. And, and bringing him to Temple really was one of the, the greatest joys and, and, and pride, uh, proud moments of, of my career. And he had an enormous impact. Our students loved him. I put in the chat a piece that a couple of uh, our students wrote for the Temple News uh, about taking his class. Um, as you all know, I mean, he was the combina he, he was a unique combination of, of heart, brains, energy, warmth, compassion, uh, humor, um, uh, unlike anyone else I've ever known in that regard in terms of the, just the toolbox um, that he had. And, um, you know, it, it, it was an absolute stunning moment for me. Um, you know, I, I will tell you that he, he, was, he was at the peak of his, uh, of his time at Temple. Um, both in terms of what he was doing in the classroom. And um, he also, I, I recruited him. And I also happened to be the chair of the Lenfest Institute for Journalism, which owns the Inquirer uh, in Philadelphia. And as you know, they had, as many newspapers did, they had their, um, a very serious reckoning uh, on their culture uh, and, and history uh, and, and present with race uh, this summer. And I recruited Brian to co-lead a group of people who is doing a, a content and, and culture audit of the Enquirer. And he was just finishing that up and, and had done a spectacular job that, that's really gonna make a huge difference there. So that'll be another piece of his, of his legacy. Um, we are, uh, you know, I, I left it to the family, of course, to decide whether they wanted to start a scholarship at Temple or, or elsewhere. They decided to do it at Temple. So we'll be sharing that information um, with all of you um, within the next couple of days. And, and for those who don't know about Temple, I mean, it's a very appropriate place in terms of Brian's values, because public university, um, large, uh, uh, the, the student body is incredibly diverse. Um, we were two years ago, the winner of the, the nation's uh, top uh, award for equity and diversity. So it's a place you can rest assured that, that anything you might contribute will be well used uh, at, at Temple in Brian's uh, memory. Um, one other thing I'll just share with the group and not to be published anywhere, please, although I guess we're live streaming, but we've, we've taken good care of Shauna in terms of um, the, she, she will pay no tuition uh, for the rest of her time at Temple uh, beyond uh, Brian's life. So again, thank you all uh, for being here. Thank you, David, for sharing that. I appreciate the uh, kind words everyone is uh, suggesting about the appreciation I did for the undefeated. And Kevin Merida and I were talking about Brian for an hour a couple of days ago. And you know, we actually were talking a lot about his impact. And Brian, I mean, Kevin asked me if I would write an appreciation and I, uh, course wanted to help everybody remember Brian as we did and in that piece I wrote toward the end about a particular day in 2004 uh, in which I had my very first real serious encounter with Jerry Sethos and uh, I'll let him share what he remembers about that day but uh, Jerry, at the time, I think, was vice president of Knight Ritter, and he tapped 
Ryan to be assistant uh, vice president for news. And so, Jerry, uh, in addition to talking about our, our favorite day with Brian, if you could also share all of your other days with Brian. And, and you were at the dean of uh, LSU, school, Mansfield School, but I'll let you start talking to you. I'll shut up. Thanks, Herb, for inviting me to participate. And thanks for your great piece today. Actually, that piece, uh, which I read this morning, uh, and my daughter finding some of us with Brian, uh, finally bond society. to post a Facebook item today. So I apologize if any of you have seen that because I'll probably repeat a few of, um, a few of the stories. The day that Brian, uh, the day that um, Herb was talking about was um, I think one of the scariest of our lives. Um, we didn't know it at the time, but Brian uh, at an ASNE meeting had uh, gone into a diabetic shock and uh, our collective medical knowledge wasn't uh, wasn't very good, but um, uh, Jay Harris and Herb and a few others uh, and I tried to help Brian and the scary scene that I will never forget, and Herb, I'm sure it's in your mind, somebody asked Brian to stand up and thread a belt through the loops on his pants to make sure that he was kind of with it. And he, he couldn't stay awake long enough to do that. I, I've repeated that story to many doctor friends who have said, you idiot, he was in a diabetic coma. Didn't you know that? Well, none of us knew it. But um, uh, I was assigned somehow to take Brian to the airport. And thank goodness, uh, Tahira called me and said, don't do that, go to a hospital. So we did right over the bridge in Virginia. And I still remember a, a doctor telling us that his blood sugar was 700 or something, which is extremely high, I learned, and said, do you have kids? Yeah, I said, yeah, I got two kids. And he said, you know, you're not going to live to see them grow up unless you get your act together health-wise. And I'm, I guess I'm grateful for whoever that doctor was uh, because Brian uh, at least did get to see them almost, almost grow up. Um, just a couple of other brief thoughts that come to mind. David Boardman mentioned Brian's warmth, which repeatedly has shown up in, in uh, memories about Brian. And I was just shocked a few years ago when, when Brian, um, uh, who had known my daughter and David Arnold's daughter since they were babies, uh, Brian realized, or Brian knew that my daughter was in Washington and that Nicole Arnold was in New York. And sort of out of the blue, he invited them down to kind of a reunion dinner uh, for having known them 20 years. And it was just such a, a Brian thing to do out of nowhere. And there's a picture of the three of them on my. On that post. Uh, sorry, I said I wasn't going to do this. Uh, just another funny example of Brian's warmth and and. Somebody talked about how Brian would be running this show right now if he, if he were around. And it's so true. Um, years ago, I don't know what year NABJ met in Orlando, but it's in my head that uh, there was an Orlando meeting. And a friend of mine who Brian knew came over to help me um, uh, get uh, the web working in my house. And those of you who know me well know that screwing in a light bulb is beyond my uh, capabilities. So my friend who uh, was an electrical engineer type couldn't figure it out. So we called Brian and it turned out, I didn't know it, but Brian was, I think maybe meeting with Will Sutton and some others on NABJ business, clearly very busy, but guess what? Brian said, oh, okay, I can help you. And he talked my friend through the, through the wiring. Not a big deal, but just a reminder of, um, as um, Art said of, of the fact that, uh, He's your, uh, he's your um, go-to guy. And then just one last thought. Many recollections have talked about how Brian was so good at bringing disparate people together um, and, and, and staying in touch with them over the years. And I, I have to laugh. Um, a, a few of us, including Red Stewart, I believe, were having dinner in Washington, and it may have been um, before a memorial service for Dory Maynard. That's kind of floating around in my head. Anyway, a bunch of sort of senior people there. And Newt Gingrich, of all people, walks into the restaurant with his wife and bellows 
out, hey, Brian, what are you doing here? And I just had to laugh that out of the whole group, Brian was the person that knew. And of course, Brian introduced all of us to Newt, who wouldn't have any idea who I am now, but, uh, but it was just such a Brian moment. And then a, a, a more recent one, uh, I was again in Washington for something, and Brian called and said, hey, Omarosa is writing a book. I said, Omarosa, as in Trump? And he said, yeah, 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 she's a, she's a good friend of mine. I said, well, of course she is. Um, and he said, uh, would you come over to dinner? Uh, the book's coming out in a few days. Would you come over and kind of coach her about how to deal with the press? Mm -hmm. So I went to dinner, and I'll tell you, Omarosa needed zero coaching. She could have coached me. It was a lot of fun. And then talking about disparate parts, and then I'll shut up, or disparate people, um, a, a, a very few of you know that I was real sick a couple of summers ago. And a friend of mine in D.C., a, a childhood friend, had a, had a party celebrating the fact that I was okay in November of 2019. And I opened the door to his apartment. A bunch of old friends were coming. I knew that Brian was coming and that Abe was coming with him. And I opened the door. And I said, Omarosa? And she said, yeah. She said, Brian told me you were sick. And I wanted to see you all well. And here I am. And we have tons of pictures of her with my daughter who was very, 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 very close to Brian. Anyway, um, Herb, I'm sorry that that was all disjointed, but thank you for letting me join in and be disjointed. Sir, so that was very nice. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, President Greg Lee, are you ready now? Can you hear me this time? Yes, sir. Good afternoon, Andy BJ. How are you doing? Um, there are three things that I remember Brian for that were very distinct uh, in my time with him. It was um, he exposed uh, people to things, he spurned to action and reflection. And there's three things, examples of that. Never forget when I was a younger board member with serving on the board with him, he took to board, we were in Tampa for a board meeting. He took us to the, the Fanta's Steakhouse there, uh, Burns. I was a young kid, never been to a big steakhouse, never seen a big wine room. And Brian was just showing off all the different wines, referring to all the food you can eat and the steak, what type of steaks you can eat. So as a kid from New Orleans, you know, I like my Cajun food and all that stuff, but taking us for that experience as a young kid on the board, I never forget that experience. Uh, the second thing was action. Um, I was just starting off as sports task force chair and he was president. And then the Diane Imus thing happened. And uh, the sports task force member was like, Greg, you gotta get Brian to speak out on this. I just called Brian and said, look, the sports task force needs you to do this. And he just did it. He went out there and took care of what put, put the whole weight of NABJ behind uh, the whole Diane Imus situation. And uh, I will never forget that. And my last uh, memory of uh, my, my last conversation with him in person with Brian uh, was a re reflection. Uh, we were at the uh, sports task force party in Miami. We were outdoors. Uh, we were having a drink together. And he took, he took me, he took, put his arm around me and said, Greg, first I'm a toast to, but secondly, Look at this entire night. Um, you should reflect on what you have done. This is what you have done for NABJ for the last 20 years. Um, you should be proud of that. You should always hang your head, head up. And uh, at that time, I wasn't trying to think of reflection, but I would, at, at the end of the night, I thought about it. I sat down and said, you know, I never thought about it that way. So Brian left me with something that I probably would never thought about that night. And uh, so... I'm just real sad to, to, uh, to see Brian go and he's away from us, he's, but he's not far from us. And I'll never forget those three major experiences that I've had uh, with him. Um, and, um, you know, as the President um, Fennell said, he's part of the Red League Small Club of NBJ Presidents, and it's just tough to see uh, one of us go, but he's not going to go far from me and all of us. And uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you, guys. All right. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, President Kathy Times, would you like to share? Hello, uh, Mr. President. Thank you for asking. I really appreciated this opportunity to uh, join and reflect on Brian's uh, many contributions and I have not prepared anything, but I would be remiss if I didn't say anything briefly. And I reflected the other night when we gathered with his board members to share uh, just a lot of really good 
times with Brian. And I will just share this as I did the other night with everyone here, that he was so smart and his visionary leadership expanded beyond NABJ as we know, but he really took the time to check in. And I'm so glad that I had an opportunity to see him in Miami briefly, but he was always genuinely interested in catching up and knowing what we were doing and very eager to assist. And I just wanted to share this briefly that after my term ended, I started an online business with African-American businesses in mind and connecting them to opportunities. And Brian said, just matter of factly, why don't you partner with Yelp? <laughs> and uh, that just showed me how uh, forward thinking he was. Well, lo and behold, that conversation was probably 10 years ago. And I smiled uh, last year when I saw Yelp announce its black restaurant directory. And that just goes to show you how Brian thought. He was just brilliant, but so caring and really wanted to assist me. And I will miss that so much. So thank you for the opportunity. It was a pleasure to serve as his membership chair. And when I did things as his membership chair, he always made me feel so appreciated. And that's the spirit. That's what I will remember I think most about Brian and appreciate his many contributions, but just how he had the ability to make you feel so special. And I send condolences to his family and his friends and colleagues at Temple. And um, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Uh, President Sarah Glover, are you able to go now? Yes, thank you, President Lowe. Good afternoon, NABJ. It's a pleasure to speak with you all about an important person to so many of us across multiple generations. And Brian is someone who was a mentor to me, one of the first professionals I came to know in NABJ as a student. And he certainly did take me under his wing and he did so without asking. He often gave his opinion and guided me um, in the early parts of my career. And I praise God that he did because he constantly pushed me and challenged me. He criticized and constructively lifted me up at the same time to, said, to say, you can do better on that image composition. You need to light it this way. And Brian had that impact on so many emerging journalists. So when I heard and when he told me he was heading to Temple to be a professor there, it was it, it was just like butter. It made all the sense in the world because he's been shaping the lives and the careers of so many of us. Um, and, you know, beyond those tactical things that he's done for many emerging journalists, he's done so much for the association. He um, was president through what, 2005 to 2007. He always made a way back to organizational business to support and help, um, you know, past presidents, the current president he's helped and I can tell you that his, his footprint is well beyond the two years that he served as president. I was fortunate to serve as his secretary during his term. He'll be sorely missed. There truly is no other Brian Monroe. Um, and one of the best things about Brian that I often got the chance to see over the years and getting to know him well, but also that I saw him when I'd watch him in the room was his gregarious nature and his fun loving spirit and his kind heart. Brian was not a person who came to any conversation with, um, you know, an ill will. He constantly looked for the good in every conversation and every matter. And he did his best to encourage and lift you up. And that is a spirit of giving. It's a spirit of kindness and certainly a legacy that we can all remember and hopefully continue to emulate because that leadership is a special kind of leadership. And so Madam President Tucker and to all the past presidents, our staff and to everyone who's all the members and past committee chairs, you know, to think that he has had an impact on so many of us over three plus decades. Um, I share with you in this sorrowful time and I wish you all the best and I'm praying for your comfort. This is a tough one and God bless you all. Thank you, thank you. Christine Harris, would you like to share? Uh, let me unmute here. Hello, everyone. It is wonderful to see so many familiar faces. Uh, Jerry Seppos, 
uh, you know, I send you and your family lots of love and, and Richard Prince and I go back, what, almost 50 years and uh, Renee Ferguson and I go back more than 50 years. Uh, we were roommates in college. Um, and I'm here not only as a past member of NABJ and a past president of the Chicago Association of Black Journalists, and now a retired journalist, but also as the godmother of both of Brian Monroe's children. Uh, there's a lot of deep history between our two families. Uh, I wrote in the condolences that both of my daughters who are now 35 and 36 um, babysat for Brian's children. And, uh, and um, he, he came to my house uh, last February and bought Abe and uh, his aunt Snazzy. And as irony would have it, I recently moved from Oakland to Richmond, California, and his aunt Snazzy lives in Richmond, as does her daughter. So I'm now even closer to members of uh, Brian's family, and I've been in touch with all of them in any event. Um, and uh, as some of you may know, I was also at one point married to the former Jay Harris, or well, not the former, the, he is still Jay Harris, uh, but he was the former publisher of the San Jose Mercury News. And uh, he and Brian worked together. And that is when I met Brian in the 90s. Uh, so this is a deep loss on a personal level for Brian's family, for my family. Uh, as with Jerry Sepos, uh, my oldest daughter, Jamara in particular, was very close to Brian. And I'll end on one funny story. Um, last month, um, no, actually, uh, it might've been earlier this month, Brian called my daughter and wished her happy birthday. And she said, it's not my birthday, my birthday's July 1st. And they got a big laugh out of that and talked about her fake birthday and then stayed on the phone for another hour and had a wonderful visit. And uh, <clears throat> other than him texting me for my new address, that was our last family contact with Brian. So uh, my other daughter is eight months pregnant. I have to go to her house in San Francisco. I will sign off, but I will never forget uh, Brian and uh, all the contributions many of you have made as well to journalism. Thank you and God bless and goodbye. Wait, wait, Christine, thanks. I, I should say uh, that day that Jerry and I have spoken about with Brian in 2004, uh, when I had, uh, when I found Brian, I was like, okay, who do I call? So I called Jerry Seppos and he tells me to go maybe run, get some towels or do something. And when I come back to the room, there's a black man in there who I had never met before. And I'm thinking, oh shit, things are really serious now. There's Jay Harris. <laughs> and I'm just like, <laughs> what the hell is going on? <laughs> so, and so that day after, and what Jerry doesn't, uh, he talked about how Brian had the belt and everything. So we finally get him ready to leave the room. And Brian walks out the room with the brother man swag that was so amazing for someone who could barely stand up, but he's trying to walk out with swag, bouncing off the, the walls in the hallway. It was just hilarious, right? So that evening, a couple hours later, Tahira get, is on my phone and she says, do you see Jay Harris? And I said, yeah, he's standing over there talking to Sandy Rupp. And she says, I need you to get him to Brian because Brian is about to drive himself to the airport. <laughs> and so me and Jay had to go back upstairs, get to Brian. I guess get Jerry, you came with us and everything. But Brian thought he was Brian thought he was Superman. And uh, but again, as Jerry said, what the doctor had to really let him know, he was not Superman. He had met his kryptonite. So. Yeah, I, I was familiar with that story. Uh, Jay told me that. And uh, for those of you who do know Jay, by the way, he is doing well. Uh, he lives on Bainbridge Island off of Seattle. And uh, we have a wonderful relationship and talk on the phone three and four times a week. So I will be sure to let him know uh, that some of you were here. Um, um, thank you. In thank any you. event, I do have to go to my daughter. So thank you very much. All right. Bye. All right. Uh, 
Sharif Dorms. Uh, Herb, do we want to Herbert? Do we want to set the room? Since okay. we're Go ahead, please, please. an hour, okay. Sure. They do well, like they say in Clubhouse. Uh, you know, let me just for uh, just welcome again and and thank everybody for being here and uh, more importantly, thank you for your 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 patience um, because as we said at the top of the hour, this was something that Herb and Marissa and I literally talked about yesterday afternoon, less than 24 hours ago, uh, and decided to put it together. So we're pulling it off and it's just an opportunity for us to reach out to each other and you know, do a collective hug. And I wanna give a, a special thanks to all of the uh, former presidents, Kathy Times, Greg Lee, Sarah Glover, Arthur Fennell, Will Sutton, Herbert Lowe, uh, who have joined us today, it really means uh, a, a lot, I'm sure, to all who are here, because uh, as, as you said, this is a this is kind of a, a, a different kind of club, and I'm I'm honored to be a part of it. And so many of you have helped me, and uh, and as we've talked about, Brian was definitely somebody who helped us all. I just also want to make note of a couple of our board members, our current board members who are here. I saw Ken Lemon, Michelle Fitzhugh Craig and Roland Martin, and I want to thank you guys. So uh, you know, this is, again, an opportunity for us all to share our, share our stories, and I appreciate everybody being here. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sharif, you are still president of uh, NLGA, is that right? Yes, NLGA, the, the Association of LGBTQ Journalists. Okay, well, um, Ryan, I know, is a big supporter of you and that group. Um, could you please uh, share with us your thoughts? Um, absolutely. And as you know, a lifetime NABJ member, and, and um, you've obviously seen Brian throughout the years, I'm, I'm moved by the stories that we're telling today. Um, and the beautiful thing about Brian's life is that um, it's not unusual to hear stories like this about him. Uh, people shared them during his life and were touched by him. And so that, that's just very powerful to me. Um, two uh, things that I will mention. Um, one, um, I am recently, um, you know, within the past few weeks, um, back at my hometown paper, the um, News and Observer in Raleigh. Um, and uh, when I heard um, word about Brian's passing, um, you know, I immediately told my editor uh, and, didn't think about this, um, but we were within, coincidentally within about a half an hour of a meeting of all of the Southeast editors in McClatchy. Uh, and that included Brian Kaplan of the Biloxi um, Sun Herald. And he, uh, you know, my boss immediately told him and he, um, as soon as we came on the line was telling stories of uh, the coverage of Katrina and how much of a lifeline um, Brian was um, during that time. I happened to be a uh, reporter at the Charlotte Observer during that. And there were just so many stories of him um, getting resources for people there, being the person on the other end of the phone to support uh, reporters and editors um, during that time. And it's just, he is a hero to this day to that newsroom. Um, and it was just in incredible to be, be able to hear that in that moment. Um, the other thing I'll mention is that, um, Two years ago, um, Brian uh, joined um, me and some others as, as judges of the National Headliner Awards. And, you know, I'd, I'd um, been a judge there for five or six years now um, and loved the group. But it was just amazing having Brian's edition there, particularly as we were judging, um, as we were judging entries in which race was explicitly talked about as a factor um, in some of the issues that were being raised in the stories and particularly investigative stories in which race was um, brought up. Um, and, you know, I was making arguments to my fellow judges um, that it was important that um, these issues were being named and it wasn't kind of just being side, you know, ducked to the side in terms of an issue that was causing some of these problems. And Brian, you know, saw that other people weren't jumping in to support that argument. And he immediately jumped in and said, you know what, it is important that this is raised um, and brought up as a, a daily issue in people's lives. And I thought that that was important. And we can just see even more so how important that is in our coverage now. 
Um, and so I, you know, there are a lot of memories of Brian, but those are two that really jumped to mind. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Meredith, Meredith Artley. Uh, Brian was at CNN in a couple of capacities. And you, uh, I won't say your title because I'm sure I'll understate it, but you basically helped to run CNN. Would you please share with us, welcome by the way, and would you please share with us, um, you said some nice things in the CNN bit. Would, would you just please share with us, please? Yeah, of course. Can you hear me okay, Herb? Yes. It's so good to see you and Myra and Sharif and his new gig and everyone here. It's so, it's just wonderful. So thank you for putting this together and having this and thanks for letting me know. Uh, it's just, it's good to be here. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, what I, what I said uh, about Sharif and the article, I'll expand on it a little bit. Um, um, what I, sorry, what I said about um, Brian in the article, I will expand on, which is he was so, um, he was such a presence. He was so, he was, he was so large. He was so, um, he was such a magnet, right? And so at any event, whether it was a meeting at CNN or whether it was an industry event, um, you know, something at, you know, ONA or South by Southwest or NABJ or anywhere, there was just a crowd of people around him because he would hold court and he would tell these great stories and he would um, attract people, everyone. And um, it was very, it, so he, so he had this general, um, charisma that was so powerful and then on top of that he had all of this expertise this journalistic um just smartness and i mentioned connecting the dots and he would always talk about that uh, i mentioned connecting the dots in the in the cnn obit and tribute that ray sanchez did for him um, that was one of the, the the things that I said because he was so he was always talking about connecting the dots, and for a while, it, for me, it, it's always been such a statement that has been such a, um, a, a, a journalistic trope. But he uh, he really meant it, and it took me a second to understand that he. Um, he was talking about a very specific technique to give context, to give uh, history, uh, to not just say what things are, but what they mean. And that's one of the things that he brought to uh, certainly CNN at his, at his time that he had uh, with us and certainly to journalism writ large. And um, so I always appreciated that expertise on top of this guy who everybody just wanted to be around, you know? And, um, and then the other thing I'll say is there was one time I came to Washington. I'm, I'm in Atlanta. I came to Washington. Uh, and he was like, I gotta take you to this place. I don't know where the place was. It was a, it was one of those like bars that like didn't have a sign outside. And he was like, you're going to love it. They have the best drinks. It's really fun. There's great people there. And you just want to, you know, yeah, I just got to take you there. And what I loved about it, and it was super fun. We had a great night. Um, but what I loved about it was like his enthusiasm, like nobody knows about this place. I want you to know about it. It's super great. And we just had a great chat about, you know, work and life. And so, uh, you know, there are those people that you work with where the relationship goes beyond being a, um, a professional relationship and when you really know that someone is a good human and you want as much of them as you can possibly get and that's how I, I felt about Brian and it's tough to say that in the past tense because I still feel that way um, but I'll, I'll, 
I'll stop there for now. Thank, thank you, you for letting me know about this, Herb. Good to see you. Good to see you, Meredith. Thank you. Uh, Myra Lowe, uh, you are on the call from among those young troublemakers from mainstream media <laughs> who went to Johnson Publishing at the behest or the recruitment of Brian Monroe. Can you talk about those times, 2000, and, and what it was like in 2008 to be working at Ebony and Jet with Brian Monroe? Um, can you talk about that, please? And whatever else you want to talk about, Brian and you. Sure. Um, before I, I talk about uh, J uh, Johnson Publishing, um, you know, Herb and I laughed that Brian was our Forrest Gump in the best of ways, right? I mean, he just seemed like he knew everybody. He was at the seminal moments of, of, of life. And um, when I spent the week kind of reflecting on our intersections, he has touched my life in big and small ways. So when Brian went to Johnson Publishing and he was pulling together his team, um, he decided to create a new position, um, assistant managing editor for both Ebony and Jet. And uh, he was looking for someone who could basically run the editing operation. And he reached out to me and said, Myra, I'm creating this job and I think you'd be good for it. And um, so I said, really, you know, tell me more about it. And as he laid it out to me, uh, he, he clearly had, I can say this, me in mind for the role. But I wasn't quite sure if that was a move I wanted or needed to make because things were good where I was at. Most of you who are in journalism know that I was at Newsday and I was about to make another move at Newsday. But Brian, I trusted his instincts and I trusted the direction he wanted to take both of those publications. And I took a leap of faith. It's probably one of the best leaps in my career that I've made, getting the opportunity to work at those publications. At that time, being, um, helping to help him help those, those publications, as we like to say, meet the moment with um, Barack Obama ascending to become president of the United States, living in Chicago at that tremendous time. It was just an amazing point in my career and I will be forever grateful for him tapping me for that opportunity. Um, in addition to the Forrest Gump moments, Herb and I were laughing today and I would say Apple should have paid Brian dividends, because he is the reason why we are Mac users today. I mean, uh, I remember us visiting Brian when he was a Neiman fellow and he interest, introduced us both to the iPod. And right away, uh, uh, Herb and I were hooked on Macs. And to this day, we are Mac households, we're iPhone users. And again, you know, knowing Brian, his love for technology, um, and digital innovation is just an example of him bringing us along as he likes to do uh, in this realm. So uh, it was an honor to work with him. Uh, as someone said, we didn't always, always agree on, on decisions or, or direction, but all in all, we knew that Brian was there for the good of the publications and to serve a community that was important to all of us I think Candy, uh, Candy um, is on, I call her Candy X is on the call. And she, uh, along with me, worked at Johnson Publishing to move Jet Magazine along. And um, I will never forget those days of working in JPC and then following Brian um, in his career and advising me along the way. As I said in a little Facebook post today, 
he was like a, a brother who advised and coached and um, I will miss him dearly. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Myra Lowe. We have uh, another NABJ president with us, uh, Bob Butler, please. I know you guys got deep roots together in the Bay Area. Um, well, please share your thoughts with us, sir. Thank you. Hello, family. Sorry I'm late. I have, we're moving and I had to meet with contractors at our house. Uh, you know, I was late to NABJ, as many of you know. I didn't know, know anything about NABJ. It was not a chapter of San Francisco State. I was a late bloomer anyway. And in 2000, somebody uh, with, with AFTRA asked me if I was going to the convention. And I walked into that Phoenix convention for the first time and I was hooked. And I had to come back every time. 2002, Brian called me and said, hey, I need someone, I need you to run for VP of broadcast for BABJA, the Barrier Black Journalists Association. And I'm like, what do I have to do? And he explained it, I ran, I won, and pretty soon I became the chapter president. 2007, he called me again. Uh, this is after I had left CBS Corporate HR. I said, you're, you're a full member still, right? I said, yeah, I need you to run for a Region 6 uh, re representative for NABJ. Okay, what do I have to do? And he told me, and I did. And that really is the beginning of my NABJ uh, leadership story, uh, being on the, the local board with uh, President Barbara Sierra, then President uh, Kathy Time, then under President Greg Lee, and then I became president. And it was all because of Brian. Um, he invited of our students died at the convention in 2005 in Atlanta. Um, so Brian had a big impact on my NABJ life. Um, and I, I, I try to, I told people and joke before, if you, if you don't like me, blame Brian, because he's the one that got me in here. But I'm forever grateful for that. You know, eight years on the board, and, and now I haven't missed a convention yet. And I don't think I ever will until I pass from this earth. So RIP to Brian. I mean, uh, I was shocked, as I'm sure everybody else was. And it's a huge loss for NABJ. It's a huge loss for his students. It's a huge loss for journalism. Um, so that's it. Thank you very much. And I'm glad to see my family. All right, Glenn. Thank you. Glad to see you. Achille Ramses, you uh, go back with Brian to San Jose as well. Um, share your stories, please, then and now. Um, yeah, Brian was very key <laughs> um, in shaping my career, actually. Uh, the story of me coming to San Jose is actually... Um, Kind of funny. I first met him uh, at uh, NABJ was in Chicago, and I actually wasn't involved in NABJ at the time. But I had some friends who told me, "Come, come on up." Uh, most of you might know who know me. I, I ride motorcycles, and I was actually on a motorcycle trip, <laughs> and I was passing through Ohio, and they said, "Girl, come on up here and just see what's going on." And I got there, found out about you know, the Visual Task Force, and people were involved in. And this big guy comes up to me who I'd never met. And he says, I've been hearing a lot about you. I, I want you to think about coming to work for me at the San Jose Mercury News. And I'm like, I was working at the Atlanta Journal and Constitution at the time. And I said, well, uh, I've always wanted to work for the Merck. I'm a California girl. You know, I'm a, as a, one of the best visual papers in the country. I said, but my oldest son at the time was a junior in high school. And um, as we both found out from each other, we're both military brats. Uh, my dad was a career Marine. And I remember being dis my life being disrupted too many times moving and I wasn't gonna subject my child to that. So I told Brian, I had to pass. Well, then the next year at NABJ, I came, I actually joined up then. He came at me again and says, look, I still want you to come to NABJ. And I'm saying, Brian, this is even harder. My son is in his senior year of high school. There's no way I can disrupt his life like this. He says, well, at least come out and visit. Talk to the people, see what we could do, and we'll work it out. And he also knew we were in the midst of buying a house, selling our, still selling our house in uh, Los Angeles. My husband was still in Los Angeles. He says, look, you can do it undercover. We can you know, keep it secret out of the newsroom. You know how newsrooms are when people start interviewing for jobs. It doesn't keep quiet for long. So he arranged for it to be a trip for me and my husband to get together. <laughs> and uh, 
brought me out, interviewed offsite. Everything went really great. And I really wanted to work for the Merck, but I just said, I, and this is like around October uh, of, of that year. And I said, I, I'd love to, but I just can't do it. Well, he actually somehow arranged to hold that job for me until that following June. So my son could graduate and I could come work for the Merck. And that's how my life started at the Merck. And then the minute I came to the Merck, he told me, um, I want you to run for chair of the visual task force. I'm like, Brian, I'm just starting a new job. I got all these responsibilities. How am I supposed to run? I don't know nothing about running no task force. He says, you'll be fine. And we'll get you the support you need. And that began my uh, leadership role within NABJ and the visual task force. And, um, that was probably the most special thing about Brian. He's the kind of person who would see something in you, maybe you didn't even see in yourself, uh, and will pull it out of you and push you and to, to levels you didn't even quite imagine for yourself. And here I am 20 years later, still involved in ABJ, became, uh, was, I was VTF chair for about four years and uh, became part of the, the student project and just to see the development along the way. And he's always someone I can come to and talk to about issues I was going on within work or just life in general. And just always, he was just the happy warrior is an apt phrase for him because you, there was nothing that you could say to keep him down. And it was really quite the shock to just to know such a vital force has gone from our lives right now. So I just want to say thank you for having this forum so we can kind of talk and share memories of someone who was so vital to not only our organization, but to, again, to journalism at large. And to so many of us, he mentored through and developed and pulled through closed doors. So it's gonna be uh, Thank you, thank you. I, I've got a couple people who have raised their hand and uh, this is a good time if anybody else wants to raise their hand so I could put you on the list. I have basically Dr. Sib next and then Robin Washington after that, and then I can take some other comfort. Dr. Sid. Here we go. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon, NABJ. Thank you, Madam President. Marissa and former President Herb Lowe and others. This is such a crazy time, you know? It's just a crazy space. So I was on Facebook, saw it come across Facebook and didn't want to believe it. Like, what, huh, who? So of course we quickly talked in our groups and text and said, yeah, this is real. And I want to share some quick things with you. So I took a random call earlier today from my god brother, and one of his friends actually grew up with Brian's family in Fort Lewis when he was in high school. So she also wanted to send her love and support, and I supported her as well, so she shared her sadness. So quick ones. Bourbon Street, New Orleans. If you can only imagine how much fun we had in that French Quarter. This is recorded and going out, so that's all I'm gonna say, but we had a great time. <laughs> all right, in a board meeting in DC when he was at CNN Politics, he was so excited to take us on a tour. You know, that's him, life of the party, introduced us to everybody, knew everybody and Jesus. So, you know, we're walking <laughs> through with him, with his spirit, and it was just a great time. You know, that's the funny part. Every memory everybody's going to share is that smile, is the joy, is the love. The other one, other ones real quick. So Minneapolis, 2015, we're on the bus going to Paisley Park and there weren't any seats available. So here comes Brian sitting next to me. I said, you nut, I'm not fooling with you on this bus ride to Paisley Park. We get there, Brian disappears. Brian goes dark. After the fact, he says, oh, I was in an interview with Prince. I said, you could have tagged a sister. You could have blinked. You could have done something to say, let's go to see Prince. <laughs> that was one. And the most recent one is last year. We were tasked with an online conversation for educators about teaching online. So many of us had reached out to Madam President and said, hey, this is something we want to do. This is something we need to do. But who took charge? You had Rita Hill, you had Michelle Johnson, you had Susan Mango Curtis, all of us in the room, but we let that blasted Leo lead us. And we tell you, we had a good time with him. 
So I just want to share the joy. We're going to miss him. Lord knows. But just through the years, you know, I've been on panels with him, workshops with him, and I'm just a regular member, so to speak. So, you know, that's he, who he is and was and will always be. The person with the big enough shoulders and arms. Sometimes God makes us big for a reason. He had a whole lot of love to give and a whole lot of hugs. You know, nothing like that bear hug, nothing. And so I just wanted to share that with you. And um, thank you for doing this, you guys, because, you know, all of us may not have a moment to speak like this. And so I just think it's healthy. Cry if you want to, everybody. Crying is healthy. You know, part of the challenge is we're not crying. We're not grieving. We're taking on all this trauma without realizing this mess hurts. So I will leave you with the laughing. Let the Leo lead, because right now he's leading us together. Peace. Thank you, Dr. Sid. Uh, former parliamentarian of NABJ, Robin Washington, please. Thank you. So, Myra, I have to uh, add an addendum to your uh, Forrest Gump and say he was also George Bailey uh, because of all the lives he touched, <laughs> although he was way beyond Bedford Falls, okay? <laughs> but, uh, uh, and he would never know all the lives he touched. Everybody, obviously, in this room and thousands of others. I don't remember, like so many people in NABJ, where and when we first met decades ago. Um, I know we actually ran against each other twice. And I think it was vice president of NABJ and vice president of Unity. Uh, and I pulled out of the vice president in NABJ and said, congratulations, sir. You got the job. Then in Unity... Somehow we end up on the board together and we accidentally ran against each other. We didn't realize we were both declared and it was a tie. And it was really a watershed moment because all the unity issues between organizations. Here he had two NABJ representatives and they're tied. And we went into a room together and said, well, let's look at the future. You're going to be NABJ president. I'm terming out if I'm not in this job, officer. And we need continuity. So if, would you appoint me when you become NABJ president back to unity? He said, yes. Once again, congratulations, Mr. Vice President. It worked out very well for everybody. Uh, more directly, I asked him again, we were on some board or something, and the job in Duluth, Minnesota is editorial page editor for then Knight Ritter came up and I asked him about it. And he said, Julia would love to lose my wife, Julia. And Julia wasn't too happy about that when she heard that at first. She said, who's Brian to tell me I would love to lose Minnesota? But uh, she absolutely still loves to lose. And going back to George Bailey, um, not just me becoming editorial page editor, becoming editor, hiring all kinds of people, shaping all kinds of lives, directly attributable to him. But Julia's uh, second in charge now, totally different career change, the anti-poverty agency. And I say the anti-poverty agency, you wouldn't believe how many lives have been changed and saved because of Brian. So I'm just gonna leave it right there. Thank you, Robin. Uh, Kevin Childs, please. Hello, everyone. Um, I regret to say that, uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah, good. I regret to say I never personally met Brian, but I know of his leadership and activity through the NABJ listserv. And um, I'm, uh, one example of his advocacy and his leadership has always stuck with me was uh, one time mediaed did a piece on the 23 media icons we lost in the last decade. And he flagged it because that entire list of names had no black people on it. He threw that discussion open to the listserv for our reactions and responses. And then he gave them a piece of his mind and an equally long list or of people who should have been named, including John H. Johnson and Ed Bradley and 
I will in the chat link to the piece he wrote for them because they invited him to uh, basically take them to the woodshed on this point. And the editor made a mea culpa about how, how could we have been so blind? And it, it has always stuck with me that he was forceful in advocating for us uh, in all of his roles. And that's what I wanted to share. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we have Deb Douglas and then Errol Cockfield. I'd like to thank NABJ for allowing us to hold space like this today. I just want to tell a story of how I met Brian in the first place. Uh, I was the, uh, the only black uh, managing editor at the Chicago Sun-Times at the time. And um, the institution had beat me up pretty bad around that week that I met them. And that was a reset day where my editors brought me into a room and apologized for all the terrible things they had done to us, which I'm sure has been done to you. <laughs> and um, they were like, Deborah, think about, you know, where you want to go and what you want to do. And we're going to start being nicer to you. And to kick off this new era of niceness, we're going to take you to a party tonight. So I was with the top editors and we went over to the Chicago um, uh, Cultural Center. Uh, for a reception where I bumped into Brian and John Yearwood. And they came over to me and introduced themselves and they said, are you a member of NABJ? Now I've been a member of NABJ since college and I've done like real like roll up your sleeve type work um, in three chapters, not just one chapter, but three chapters. And I'm like, yeah, but uh, what has NABJ done for me lately? And so instead of flinching, he was like, well, let's talk about that. And we talked about my hopes and dreams of what I wanted to do. And I ended up being accepted to the NABJ Kaiser Family Foundation um, uh, Fellowship to go study malaria and HIV with several other wonderful journalists in Tanzania. Um, Bob was on that trip, Bob Butler. Yes, hey Bob. And um, it was just a life-changing experience. I didn't go there with any expectations. I was tired when I went there. I wasn't trying to be anything, do anything. I was just there and it was like the best thing to do to just lay back in the cut and just be because, you know, Brian mentored all of us along the way, just the group of people that we were with, we're all still connected and close today. And I, you know, I was still in contact with Brian. I, I, uh, I showed up at his class in late 2019 when I wrote an imp impactful story and he wanted me to talk to his class about, you know, how I went about the story and, you know, uh, what transformation looks like when it comes to journalism. And we shared notes and sources and all sorts of things. I remember that time we had a slice of pizza that time he was on campus. I love going into his house to those wonderful parties uh, with, with Herb and, and Myra and so many um, other people. Um, so I'll just wrap up by saying that, um, again, this, this process of holding space, my time with Brian, is why I have the words that are on my wall. You can't see them, this pink halo behind, behind us, but the words are magnitude and bond, which comes from the um, Gwendolyn Brooks uh, words, um, when she said that we are each other's harvest, we are each other's business, um, we are each other's um, magnitude and bond. And, um, and that's what Brian meant to me, and that's what you all meant to me, so thank you. Thank you, thank you. Errol? Hello, NABJ. Um, it's so good to be with my family. Um, the last few days have definitely been a shock. Um, so I'm happy to see on my screen folks like Myra, Herb, Madam President, Richard, Bob, Fred. You know, I really, I wish I could squeeze all of you. You know, I wish I could squeeze Myra. Um, it is, it sucks that COVID is keeping us apart in moments like this where we really need to serenade a member of the family properly. Um, I'm a former president of the New York chapter and uh, I was on the board with Brian. He was the president when I was a regional director for the Northeast. And you know, what strikes me most, what I remember most about Brian is that when I was a young man on the board and a journalist coming up in the game, he gave me a sense of what is possible as a black person. Um, and NABJ gives us a sense of what is possible, right? And, and we've had so many leaders who are special in their own right, but he was particularly special for me because I saw in him how to be a leader 
um, how to bring innovation and ideas and of kind of fierceness to the work. And I also saw someone who was so comfortable in his own skin as a black man. And that comfort, it just kind of washed over me as well at, th at that stage in my life and career. And there've been others like, you know, going back to, you know, my beginning days of folks like Vanessa and Art and Herb and Vic Condis, you know, but Brian in particular, he had such ease in so many different environments. I would watch him walk from a board meeting to a reception, to some committee meeting, and there was an air about him of leadership and stature and a kind of regalness that for me traces back to our very heritage as Black people. And I remember <laughs> One story in particular, I mean, we, we worked hard, but we also played hard <laughs> with Brian's board. And there was one day when we had a dinner with some sponsors and we were in Miami and, uh, you know, board walks out and Brian's got limos for the board. He's got two limos. <laughs> and we got in the limos and, you know, we had a nice ride up to Fort Lauderdale and we had, you know, we, we drank some adult beverages and then we got to you know, the dinner and we met with some sponsors, but it was a, a moment for me that gave, what I saw in him was an agency and a license to be who we are in every regard. And that's what I'll remember about him most, just that, you know, he helped me take that hesitancy, that nervousness, that anxiety and just pull it all away. And I'll be forever grateful to him. It's it's such a loss for us, um, but but I'm so thankful for his memory, all that his legacy, and I extend condolences, deep condolences, to his family and from my, you know from the New York NABJ family and from my NBC Universal family. I'm at MSNBC. We extend our condolences. So 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 thank you all. It's just great to see you all at, at this moment. Thank you. Ken Lemon, are you still here? Or you, before you leave, can you share something as a board member? Mr. President, I, I can, and I will endeavor to be brief. At first, I thought, let me not share, especially hearing the rich story. So many of you knew him so well. We shared one important uh, conversation, and that was about four years ago, onboarding onto uh, the, the board of directors. And uh, Brian came on to, to lead a session and that session was about fundraising. And one, one person in the room raised their hand and said, you know, it, it was difficult for them to go out and, and speak uh, to sponsors. Um, and it, it was at that point that Brian called back and, and reminded us of why that was important, that the mission of NABJ and, and what that meant, what those funds meant to promoting diversity and the training and to preparing our members. And, and, and as I listen to you guys speak here, I, I hear that echoed and I hear his work echoed and I hear a side of him uh, that I unfortunately did not get to know. I wrote in my words there that I will take your expressions with me because we are all impacted. We're all changed a little more today because of what he did in each of your lives. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michelle? Hi, thank you, President Lowe, and it's, it's so good to see everybody. Um, I wanna start by saying it's really important to me when people and myself do little things for others. It might be as simple as a smile, you know, to a homeless person, giving back, just, just the little things that matter. And um, I am a latecomer to NABJ like um, Bob is, and, I did uh, serve as president, the, uh, or chaired the Council of Presidents um, under um, President Monroe's um, term. And I've gone on to be on the board, been a chapter leader and currently on the board now. And um, all those things connect me to Brian and the presidents here today, but it's the little things that and one specific little thing that it really 
touches me. Um, when I heard the news the other day, it, it was like a Mack truck. And, and I'm still listening to everyone now. I thought I had gone past it and I, it's just coming up again. Um, how he touched me in a special way. And I had just moved to the Bay Area. This was early, it was about 2005, I think. And um, I only knew a handful of people. Um, and ironically, they were all NABJ. And I was on BART and Brian called me, um, which I believe Bob gave him the number. And he was either regional director or the local chapter, but he was just welcoming me to the Bay Area and welcoming me, you know, to just, you know, anything I needed, he was there. And that just really meant so much, you know, coming to a place, I was coming by myself, um, didn't know anyone, I didn't have a job at the time, my four children were back in Arizona. So it just meant so much that he reached out and was just so nice. And I remember I was going through the Caldecut Tunnel and it cut out and I was like, oh no, but he called me right back, you know, a few minutes later and just talked to me. And it was just, that is what I always think about when I think of him, that his busy schedule, all the things he had to do at the Mercury News, at, um, you know, NABJ and elsewhere, family man, I, I just, he reached out to do that. And that just is really always gonna stay in my heart and, um, Thank you for letting me share. And it's so good to see everybody um, that I haven't seen in ages, some of you. So thank you for allowing me to do that. Dorothy? Can't hear you. Just wanted to set the room again. Um, you know, for those who are just coming in or, you know, weren't here at the top of the hour or 45 minutes after, uh, again, this is just an uh, impromptu opportunity for us to really get together in and share our memories of Brian. There is going to be uh, an official tribute. The family is putting that together. They said that's gonna happen uh, in the next few weeks. They will let us know. And as soon as they tell us, we will tell you. Um, Brian's funeral is Tuesday at 11 o'clock. The family will send us out a link and we will share that with members as well. I think, I don't know if you you heard um, Dean Boardman talk about a scholarship. He did put something in the chat room as well that the university is working on the scholarship. And of course, NABJ will be working with them and do whatever, whatever we can. Um, again, just want to thank everybody for being here. And I know we all share the same sort of feeling that these stories um, are inspiring. Uh, it is exactly what we needed at this time of, uh, in our grief. And um, it's also a reminder of how important this organization is. It's a trip down memory lane and it makes me long to see all of you guys in person. Um, we are going virtual, but we really wanna have some uh, watch parties regionally so that we can, uh, some of us can at least get together again. And this is making me ache like so many of you even more uh, to, to see you and, and touch you. Thank you. Uh, so I have one more person who is asked to speak. It's 3.30, which was around the allotted time. If anybody else wishes to speak, we're gonna to go to Candy Mayweather, part of the young troublemakers at uh, Johnson Publishing. But if anybody else wishes to let me speak, let me know while she's speaking. Um, and then we'll begin to uh, wrap it up. So Candy, please. Thank you, Dr. Lowe. Um, I just wanna uh, express my gratitude and my appreciation for Brian and for what he did for me. Um, he gave me the opportunity to have my dream job. It was a dream that I didn't even aspire to it was so high. I grew up in Chicago. Uh, and so I, Johnson Publishing has always been in my backyard. And to me, it was, um, you know, just like most African-Americans, uh, so much a part of my childhood, um, reading the magazines and, and knowing the content as well as I did. But I never applied um, for a job there. 
to this day, I don't know how I got onto the radar at JPC after Brian became the editor, but I, whoever said my name, put my name out there, I want to thank you because <laughs> uh, it really, really kind of cemented. Um, uh, it was just such a, a tremendous experience for me. I was working at the Chicago Tribune and I got a call one night uh, at my desk, someone asking me what I like to interview for a job at Ebony and Jet magazines. And I said, sure, <laughs> of course, I would love that. Um, how did you get my name? And that person, I wasn't talking to Brian, but that person wasn't sure either, uh, but they scheduled me for an interview. And I said, well, okay. You know, I was perfectly happy in newspapers at the time. I, I had never really thought of going to magazines and um, but I wanted to go inside that building, Johnson Potion Company's building on Michigan Avenue and uh, see what I'd always heard uh, about what takes place there. So I went and I interviewed uh, and uh, met Brian and met some of the other editors. And later on that year, which is 2007, I was hired uh, there to work alongside Myra and Melody and some of the other people who are on this call. Uh, right now. And Brian, my first real memory of him working for him about three weeks into my stint there was the second edition of Ebony that I was going to be working on. And the first full edition of Ebony, Brian came to my desk and I looked up at him. He said, uh, you know, we got Michael Jackson next month. And a big, Brian didn't know. <laughs> at the moment, but everybody who uh, worked with me from that point on knew and understood that Michael Jackson is my very favorite artist of all time, number one uh, ride or die fan of Michael. I said, Brian, you got to take me to meet Michael Jackson. I've, I've got to, this is my chance. You know, I've got to meet Michael Jackson. And I was, I was only half joking, but Brian, uh, you know, obviously, uh, we, we kept it business. He didn't take me to meet Michael, which I did chide him about uh, later, but I had uh, some really good opportunity to work on the story um, that he felt was one of the most important stories that he had an opportunity to work on at Ebony. It was important to me um, because it was enjoyable. It was my community. Uh, it was important. And then after that, it was a succession of similar experiences. Uh, all of the, the stories that we told at Ebony Magazine and Jet Magazine um, were important during that time and historically have been important. And so I just wanna share my appreciation for Brian. Because of Brian, we worked long <laughs> and hard. We worked a lot of hours um, at, at Johnson Publishing Company and, it was a pleasure. It's the people there that really made the experience. I call, I still call them my crew, Dudley Brooks, Myra, Sylvester Monroe, uh, the entire Jet and Ebony staff, Clarence Waldron, you know, people who's uh, Lynn Norman, uh, whose bylines I've been reading my almost my entire life, some of them uh, in Ebony and Jet magazines. And I had the opportunity to actually um, achieve this dream. And it was because Brian, uh, hired me. So I want to thank him and I want to thank all of you for allowing me to share this time and, and share this experience that I had with somebody that uh, was very important to me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Fred Sweets. On behalf of photographers everywhere who knew my larger than life friend, um, we're saddened, hurt, if for those of you who don't know, Brian started his life, his journalistic life as a photographer. And that's why he's held in high regard by those who uh, are members of the visual task force. He's been with us all the way through thick and thin. Um, and it's a, it's a hard thing for us to take. Um, my father warned me, don't, when you come late to any event, don't say a word, but uh, forgive me for being late. I've been driving to Washington, D.C., but I'm here safe and sound, and I'm going to miss my man, Brian. On a personal note, he um, 
wherever he worked, he always wanted to, man, I got to take you on a tour, whether it was Jebony, and he didn't like me calling it that, but that's how I referred to it always. For those of you who go to the auction, no, it's Jebony. Um, uh, whether it was CNN or whether it was the Merck originally uh, down San Jose. Uh, yeah, let me show you this. And wait, do you see this? And wait, do you see we got wherever it was, was the best place anyone could ever be. And he was proud of wherever you were. He rose to the top wherever he were. And um, just a, a restless, restless, confident brother. That's an understatement. Um, I love him. I miss him. And um, many more photographers that you don't know uh, or, or who aren't on this call will miss him as much as all of us do. Um, it's, it's, a rough, rough, it's a rough thing to take, but um, I think it was Faulkner who said, dying is a part of life. We'll um, hang together. I can't wait for all of us, as Dorothy said, for this uh, scene to be back in touch where we can reach out and um, have that drink. And you know, I'll give you the blues, my golfing buddy. Uh, you know you don't like for me to call you a duffer, Herb, but I can't wait for all of us to be together again. And we'll drink heavily. Well, we'll drink heartily to the memory of Brian. Thank you all. Thank you. I, I think uh, we all miss being at the visual task force and, and the auction that you do. And I remember being with Brian there and... Uh, Sonia Ross, please. Sonia. I was just trying to unmute. Sorry about that. Hi, everybody. I'm sorry to be so late, but I have to say it's good to see all these faces that are so familiar, even though we're here for a sad reason. Um, I just wanted to share a couple of really uh, funny memories about Brian. Uh, the first one is when he was uh, editor, well, I, I guess, what was his title to Ebony again? See how I didn't know that? Because I just knew he was in charge. But he, uh, he and I, he, he called me one time excited as all get out because he said, listen, we're getting, rid we're getting ready to have a funeral for the N word because it needs to go and we're gonna get a casket and everything. And he was excitedly telling me all these details. And I said, um, why you wanna do that? I can't believe that you would want to be presiding over the death of a word if you're into language. And, and we ended up having this extreme debate about the value of this N word and how black people had flipped it into a complimentary thing and denied white people the ability to use it at the same time. And he felt it had to go. And I questioned why it had to go. And this debate proceeded to continue for years. Every time Brian thought of another argument to make with me about this word, he called me and bring it up and it was on and we, we would debate this. And um, I actually am a little bit sad that he and I won't be able to continue to debate the merits of this epithet or demer demerits of this epithet. Um, and then the, the other story uh, that I wanted to share about Brian was uh, when he, also from his tenure at Ebony, and he simply called to give me condolences over the death of my mother. And we were talking and he was like, how are you doing? And I said, I'm, I'm making it. And I, he began to pull details out of me. And then he said, Sonia, you need to write this story. You need to tell this story. You're gonna tell this story. And he he poked and prodded and coaxed and poked and prodded until I actually did tell that story. Um, and I'm grateful to him for giving me that opportunity. I will share one last detail about Brian. And that is whenever I would see him at NABJ, he insisted that we take a selfie. And he was the selfie king. He was always taking selfies with everyone. But did you ever notice, did you, did you actually get custody of any of the selfies that he took? 
because he ended up being the custodian of all the selfies. I I had to kite the selfie that he took um, off of his phone. Like, get Negro, give me the phone so I can have a copy of my own selfie. Uh, and and so, what a treasure trove he must have uh, there with him. It's almost as if he wanted all of us to be with him all the time, wherever he went, and had to have a selfie for that. Um, as a result of that, the, the last time I saw Brian, which what had to have been um, in ABJ in Miami, uh, I took a selfie with him and I now have that selfie and I cherish it. So for all the sadness that we have over the loss of Brian, I, I simply will, will leave with a little verse. I don't know who the poet is who wrote it, but it just seems apropos for the moment. And it is, uh, most of all, I love you for the joy that lingers after and fills my empty life with bits of bright leftover laughter. So God bless Brian and rest his soul in sweet peace until we meet him again. Thank you. We know he's up there telling them how things ought to be. Um, we, we all know that. Uh, Roland, are you with us? Roland? Okay. All right. Well, I don't see any other hands here. So I think if it's okay, we will leave it there. I, uh, I don't know what else to say except what I wrote today, but I will say that it is rewarding to hear from all of you. Uh, you know, Brian was a complicated man. And so far, everybody has avoided reasons to say how he used to get on your last nerve for this reason or that reason. So maybe it was just me, but uh, maybe there's another one where he would get on the last nerve. And so when he texted me, on December 17th, say, hey, what's your address? I knew that meant that I was going to get this Christmas card with the bios and the way over the top Christmas card. Um, and he, uh, so he texted me. So I give him the address and I say, what's yours? Because you go, you know, if somebody's sending you one, you got to make sure the obligatory, you get the address so you could send them. So since Myra, handles the christmas cards for us because you know you know i think it's 2020 who still sends christmas cards right so she handles them so i sent her the address she says i already said he he already gave it to me because we texted him too so we're like wait he texted me and you do you think we live separately and so we talked about that afterward and we think that was just his way of wanting to touch us both at the same time and so the Christmas card comes in and I look at the picture, beautiful family. And I'm just stunned that his son is taller than him. That's all I could really see. And it's clear that these two homes have blended. And so I'm happy with that. So I'm just like, like, okay, but I didn't when Brian, as I wrote today, he said, you know, I, I didn't even see, he said, how, how y'all doing? And I'm thinking, I'm probably watching a game or I'm having a, a restful night. And what's, if I answer him, he's going to answer back. It's going to be another back. And it's going to mean that I'm going to get on the phone with him and it's going to be an hour of us arguing about something. And I didn't feel like it. And I regret that because that would have been the last time that we probably talked. And so... And if y'all text me again, I will text you back because I don't want it to be the last time and I didn't touch you back. So I love all of you. And uh, I'm supposed to be retired. And Brian has me working. He had me working Wednesday. He had me working yesterday and today. I should be golfing. And I need him to go away so I could get back to my retirement. Thank you all so much. <laughs> Herb, this ain't work. Trust me, his work. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Herb. And, and right. thanks, thanks again to everybody. Thank you. Godspeed. God
Take care, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Good to see everybody. Thanks, Herb. Thanks, President Dorothy. I see a lot of controversy about this Prince event happening in Minneapolis, Carol. That was not me, but thank you. <laughs> What you mean it was not you? What you mean it was not you? It was not me. I wish I could have taken a picture. I, I asked you if you wanted to be part of that. Your face <laughs> was just like. Oh, Speak oh, today oh. for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. All right, everybody. Have a great Have one now. Take care. Stay safe. Right. Love you. Myra, Myra, you said I could save the chat or how do we do 